get them to know wait a moment for for the others to join us. But um, I just wanted to um, to go here, mihi nui, kia tato i te nei wa, uh, kia taui na para para te nei wa. Uh, yeah, mihi nui fine. Really looking forward to having a whole little today, sharing with you um, some of my experiences with. Um, the food forest mahi, centropic agroforestry, and, and, and all of the things associated with that. O tino, uh, e ngā riu awa eke, o ngā mā tāwaka, o ngā haue oa, i karapiki mene mai nei, ki tēnei wahanga o tātou, i tēnei kame i kia kōtou. Kia koe hoki e e Gerard. Gerard, a ngā te uri o inipu kohurangi o ngā Te nā rā koe me o nui, o kōrero o ki te kōrero, a ka horahia, hei kaima ki hirikapo, hei whakaihihi, i te wairua, i te ngākau, i tēnā o tēnā o mākau, tēnā i ka mihi ki a koe. Tēnā tātou i te whānau, atu Māori e, ko Mākere e Pizahau, he uri no Taranaki, uh, e noho nei ki te ranaki i tēnei wā tonu uh, e mihi kawatu ana uh, pai hau āuru uh, ki te ki ngā pai moti, tēnā koutou Aroha atu, I'm, I'm, I seem to be gravitating to te reo Māori Noi, i tēnei wā, this welcoming everyone who's um, joined us in this breakout session with Jared Hiakita from Ngai Tūhoi uh, who's been born and raised uh, in, in Whakatane, um, and is now based in Hokianga Whakapau Tarakia, the Hokianga Nui Akupe, uh, uh, with his whaiaipo, uh, me te kaupapa i kawea nei e rāua, uh, e whakarara ana, i ngā mātauranga, a kui mā, o puru mā, he oi, hari ngātahi ana, me ngā ngātikanga, uh, ngā mahi o te ao haua no hoki, uh, ngā mahi māra, ngā mahi whakatūn whare, uh, ah, te mahi tiaki whāngai i ngā rauimi me ngā kōrero ki te katoa. Nō reira e Jared, tēnā koe, kā koe te wāi hoa. Ah, sorry, <laughs> te reo Māori a no hoki, he oi. <laughs> Kaya Patu naro naro te tana ta toi tū ko te whenu, toi tū ko te whenu a tū, tei tei ko te kahika te ao te wao nui o tāni. Ko ona rau e kai nei nga hihi o tama nui te rā kia puta mai ko te hāki rō, ko te hāki waho, ti hei maudi o. Kia ora te whānau, um, that's a great um, appreciation that I'm here today uh, and being given the opportunity to um, share some kōrero with everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just share my screen so you, you can um, see the presentation um, that I've prepared. So just give me a moment. All right. Feel free, everybody, to... Um pop some questions into the chat, and we'll do our best to, to maybe feed some of them through to Jared at the end of his kōrero. So I thought I'd kick off um, this kōrero um, just with um, uh, this, this sentence right in front of me, which is between Rangi and Papa is a plateau of vitality. Uh, and for me, what that means is that I think... Um, Almost all whenua has the potential to be vital, um, to be full of prosperity and abundance. Um, over time, uh, a lot of our whenua has been degraded um, by modern conventional practices of agriculture um, and many other things. Um, 
but I think it, there's always the potential um, within Rangi and Papa and all of um, our atua uh, in the interaction and collisions and collaborations and companionships to bring uh, whenua, bring a soil uh, into a place of vitality, of elevated modi. Um, yes, and so um, our organisation is called Ornuku. Uh, we were a recently established um, trust and our aim is to empower Māori communities to achieve that, um, to experience that prosperity and vitality through their whenua, uh, grow nutrient-dense kai, restore the whenua through those practices. So just a quick little plug there for our organisation and also just wanted to meet to Pai uh, Taina um, for her kōrero yesterday and um, uh, she mentioned o nukurangi that, um, you know, the, the multi-dimensional realms of Earth, sky, and everything in between are interconnected. They breathe the same breath. And uh, when Whaitaina was, was saying that, wow, I was just melting. Uh, it was beautiful. So, mihi nui kia koe, Whaitaina. Um, hi. So, um, yeah, just a quick little, there's our, our little symbol there in the middle. Um, and what they represent is Papatua Nuku Nangi Nui. And in between both of them is, is that plateau of vitality. Uh, so obviously today I'm, I'm here to talk about Sin Tropic Agro Forestry, um, which sounds it's a bit of a mouthful. It's a bit, bit confusing. People probably don't might not have heard that word, um, but I'm sure most people here probably have heard of a food forest. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about food forests and then about um, Sin Tropic Agro Forestry. Uh, and I'm going to share some some um, pictures and in, in in, in some video with you. But I thought a great place to start is, is by by um, anchoring ourselves into our native nahere of of, of Aotearoa. So I'd quickly, uh, um, yeah, just share a little bit about about whenua. Um, so left to its own devices. A degraded whenua will eventually form itself back into a towering native New Zealand forest of absolute abundance. If you've ever walked through Te Urewera, Lake Waikare Moana, the Warawara, or any other untouched and ancient native forests, you will know what I mean. You will know that these forests, these ecosystems, possess an unrivaled vitality. They are so alive and they thrive. And no one is watering them. No one is adding fertilizers or weeding them. They just are. They have a presence. There is a special kind of modi that exists within these types of forests, which is collectively held by the entire diverse array of plants and creatures that live here. This modi is also collectively fostered and protected and it takes hundreds, if not thousands of years, orangi, or papa, or tawhiri, tāne, tamanu, and all the forces of nature to collaborate in the creation of reaching this peak state. So that core little kind of leads me into this question, what, what is a food forest? Um, and I know a lot of people will be familiar with this, but I'll just quickly summarise it in a real simplistic way. Um, so, uh, we humans tend to separate our gardens, our forests, our orchards. They all kind of exist in separate spaces. Um, but with a food forest, it's bringing all of those things together so they exist in the same space in a way that is more um, natural, more wild. Um, and more reflective of a natural ecosystem. Um, so one of the um, foundational um, concepts behind um, most of the alternative um, means of growing food these days is observing and learning from the taiyo and applying these learnings into your practice as a grower. Um, so what that means for me is um, how, how do we elevate our awareness of and an understanding of how nature works, all of the processes involved in allowing an ecosystem to thrive because um, 
our, our Papatsu Anukutane Mahuta, um, our natural forces have mastered the art of creating highly functioning, thriving ecosystems. So there's deep wisdom within the natural world that if we look and utilize and apply into our own um, practice as growers, we can really benefit from in growing abundance, really nutrient-dense food, um, really resilient, secure food systems um, that are at less risk of penetration from pests and diseases and all that sort of thing. So the way that I like to think of it is, um, so how does Tane Mahuta express his physical formation through space and time? What does Tane Mahuta look like? How does he form himself? What's his architecture? And so one of the key things in Aotearoa especially uh, is illustrated in this next slide. So Tane Mahuta is an amazingly dense and diverse uh, being. So this picture really illustrates that. And if you can remember going into a really mature, established forest, um, you'll remember that it's so dense. There are so many plants. Um, sometimes it's so thick with density of plants that it's hard to even move move yourself through that, that forest because there's just so much um, density going on in there. Um, the other thing is um, Tane Mahuta expresses himself through diversity. So there's lots and lots of plants and there's many, many different kinds of plants and they're all occupying the same space. So just let's hold on to that for a second. Tane Mahuta, density, diversity. Now we're going to move on to another slide that's going to illustrate um, how Tane Mahuta moves through space and time. So Tane Mahuta, um, natural ecosystems, there's this term called stratification, and all that means is how they arrange themselves um, so that they get what they require. So what I what I mean by that is um, many plants need full sun, um, and without full sun, they, they they can't really exist. And many plants need semi shade in order to um, to thrive and, and exist. Some plants need heavy shade. So there's like um, an intelligence that goes on within our forests where they arrange themselves um, so that they can maximize on um, density and diversity and and the arrangement um, of, of all of those plants and trees um, is done in a way that is um, just creates a really thriving ecosystem. So that, that stratification is how that's what the plants need, and then arranging themselves physically in space to to be where they need to be in order to get what they need. Now the other part of this is succession. So um, what I mean by this is succession is basically like um, you know like some plants have a have a certain lifespan and a certain purpose. And then once they've served that purpose and um, they've lived their life as long as they can, they'll disappear from the system and a new plant will come and succeed them. Um, and this is happening all the time in natural ecosystems. Succession is a, is a, is a key part of what's going on um, in our forests, um, on any land. Now, if we were to take a degraded piece of phenyl that was bare, um, it was it was depleted. Of, what will happen? Is, um, just got a bit of noise coming from somewhere. Um, so if we got a degraded piece of phenyl, 
uh, that's bare, it's depleted, that soil will invite certain plants to come and colonize that area so that they can, um, and those plants will, will, will be given the right to exist and live there by that soil. And those plants are specially chosen for the conditions of that degraded soil because they're the pioneers. They're the plants that can come through and um, bring up um, all of the, they, they can mine and extract whatever nutrient there is in that soil they can extract it, bring it up into um, into their tinana, into their their, um, their foliage, and they're playing a role to um, repair that soil and get it ready for the next phase, for the next more complex and more demanding set of plants to to replace them. So in New Zealand, often the case is when there might be a slip or a degraded piece of land that. Um, Often manuka is, is the first, um, or tree ferns, they're the, they're the first ones to colonize that area. And then what they're doing is they're preparing the conditions for then the next set of plants to come through. And then after manuka, um, you get kamahi. And once kamahi comes up and starts shading out the manuka, then the manuka starts phasing out. And the kamahi sort of shifts the state of that ecosystem. And then our protocarps, our, our bigarimu, Tōpara, um, Kauri, all of those trees come through after that. But it's necessary to, to have each phase because those those pioneer plants like the manuka or in some cases gorse or other invasive weeds, they're playing that initial role of providing, um, repairing that, that fenua, that soil to create the conditions for the next the next set of plants to come through and ultimately we reach back into a full mature beautiful native forest um, and that is um, kind of like the ultimate expression of Kāne Mahuta a mature um, forest of diversity so we'll move on to the next slide and we'll see what's waiting here for me cool so now that brings me into some tropic agroforestry and just discussing some, some things about that. So, some tropic agroforestry is just another form of, of growing food, really. Um, uh, growing food and repairing degraded soil. Um, and everything I just explained to you about density, diversity, um, stratification and succession. All natural processes that happen in nature. Syntropic agroforestry really leans into utilizing those tools as strategies and techniques to rapidly um, accelerate the reparation of, of fenua to, um, to bring an abundant state. Um, so <laughs> When we talk about taking a piece of degraded whenua and, and it, it going through that cycle of succession to reach uh, um, beautiful, mature um, native forests, that takes five, 500 to 700 years it takes for that process to happen. And as people, um, we're in much more of a hurry. You know, we, we, wanna, we want to experience um, the abundance of our whenua. We want it to sustain us. We want to grow food from it. Um, so, um, you know, we, if we want that, we, we need to, um, we just need, need ways of accelerating that process. And that's where this particular technique comes in. It's, it's one of the fastest ways I've come across to, um, really enrich and repair a soil to provide the conditions to grow nutrient dense food and lots of it. Um, and you might be wondering, like, well, what, what's, what's, how, how is that achievable? Um, and a part of that, um, comes down to, for me, reframing our relationship with, um, non New Zealand native plants. So in this particular style of, um, growing, 
there's a lot of, we use a lot of fast growing plants, really fast growing plants. Um, and their job, uh, is to, um, reach down, uh, find as, as much nutrients and start extracting, um, pulling up all of the minerals and nutrients from the soil and bringing it up into their foliage. Um, and they're, they're doing the hard work. And underneath those, those plants, we have all of our natives and our fruit trees and all of those, all of those things. And they're just, they're just, they're there. But we've got our introduced species, like this is a Mexican sunflower. We, we use eucalyptus, acacias, um, different kinds of grasses and, um, and they're doing the hard work, the heavy lifting. Um, because if, if we just go and put our fruit trees in there straight away on a degraded piece of, of soil, they're not going to do so well. And the sun's going to come out in the summer. It's going to be harsh and hurting our, our, our sensitive fruit trees. So we use these um, introduced plants to just provide a, a nursery, grow really fast, provide lots of biomass, and they're only playing a role for a certain amount of time. And then as our natives, our fruit trees and more, more long-term trees, they eventually they'll grow up and shade these ones out. And, and all of our introduced species like these will, um, they'll phase out because they need full sun to, to actually thrive. Um, so I guess, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, um, you know, have, that's, that's easy to have a lot of baggage, um, against introduced species of plants. Um, but I, I just like to use them as, um, you know, they're a tool and they can actually, um, we can use them to bridge our finger to provide a space for, um, our natives, um, and our fruit trees to grow. Um, yes, so, um, I guess I'll just quickly talk about, uh, like one of the reasons why density and diversity is, is, is a really good strategy. Um, basically like all plants have a certain skill set or ability to access certain nutrients and minerals. And so if we have one type of plant, then that plant has only the ability to access a limited amount of minerals and nutrients and so on. But when we bring many, many plants of different kinds of plants into one space and um, lots of them into that one space, what's happening is, is they're all accessing um, different kinds of, of minerals, bringing it up into their foliage, into their branches and um and then we can use those plants, their biomass, by heavily pruning them, bringing their, their biomass back down onto the soil and feeding that soil and starting to cycle nutrients, releasing, making um, nutrients and mineral available in the soil and um, start accelerating the creation of fertile soil. So... I, I hope I'm um, I am making sense here for people. But what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to just quickly show a video. I'm not sure how long I have left. How, how long do I have to go find my kitty? Because you're you're a sole uh, kaikōrero, you might have a little bit more gift. But I just um, encourage everyone to input questions that they may have. Uh, cause, and, um, there's bound to be some questions. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, a lot of people might have heard of a, a practice called chopping and dropping. Um, and if you haven't, basically what it means is, is we, we, you can grow a plant that can handle being heavily pruned. Um, so, so we grow a lot of plants that can handle being heavily pruned and, when we prune them back, we take all of that biomass, all of that foliage, and we lay it down around our fruit trees, um, 
we lay it um, just around the, the trees we really want to akiaki and um, nurture. And what happens is all of that foliage is now feeding the soil around that um, around our fruit trees or whatever trees we decide to put it around. Um, it's feeding the microbes in the soil um, and just stimulating lots and lots of life. Um, and so I've got a, little, a video here just just illustrating how much biomass you can grow um, and then cut back around your plants. Um, and what this is, it just means that you, you don't have to um, buy as many external inputs, meaning like you don't have to go and buy your fertilizer from the shop and drive there and use fossil fuels, expend carbon into the atmosphere, then go and buy some compost that you not even sure what's in it. Um, and it's okay if you have to do that. Take to buy, like, I, I still go and buy compost now and then, um, fertilizers. Um, I try to keep it as natural as possible, organic, but I know that's not always possible for everyone. But here's a little video um, that, that I took um, that, that will just sort of show what the process looks like. So this is before the chop and drop. And this is after. And this is on the same day, and so basically I'm, I'm showing you this because you can see how much of that foliage has now been chopped back and put around our fruit trees. And all of the, it's opened up the canopy, so all of the, the sunlight can now come through. Um, oh, and, right, you're having trouble seeing your video. Oh, okay, is, is it working at all? Um, not Right. We, we're still looking at the, the framing our relationship with non-native plants. Okay, just just give me a second, bye. I will switch. Cool. Now I should have it. How's that? Ah, uh, Wow. So this is this was oh, I'll, I'll let it play and you'll kind of get an idea of what I'm what I'm talking about. And so in here there's a there's a fruit tree every meter there's there's some kind of fruiting plant whether that's a nashi pear banana taro um, mulberry citrus every single meter we have a fruit tree and in between. Um, we have some kind of um, biomass tree, like a tree that grows really fast or a plant that grows really fast. And and our um, the purpose of those plants is to um, grow so that we can prune them back and then use those prunings to put around our fruit trees. Um, might it be possible to ask you some questions now, everyone? Yes, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So we have from, is it France? Um, if you could expand on why you chose to use non-native plants, is it because New Zealand natives would not offer enough food for us? Or was this, what reason was that for choosing non-native plants? Great part, though. So, um, so I guess just quickly, um, I, I use native plants a lot as well. So right in amongst in our food forests, you'll find um, natives mixed with fruit trees and non-natives. Um, and the reason we use um, non-natives is because they're, they're a lot faster growing, like certain species of, of introduced trees like eucalyptus and Mexican sunflower and, um, and acacias. Um, they grow really fast, and what's happening is when a plant grows really fast, it's shooting down its roots into the soil, um, it's stimulating life. Where, where there's roots, there's life, microbial action, and that in itself is creating um, fertility and breaking up our heavy clay soils, um, and then we can cut, cut the, uh, prune them heavily and use all of that foliage and put it down under our fruit trees or our native trees. Um, and all the while, all of our, our long-term trees, like our natives and our fruit trees and our um, uh, other trees, they're growing up and growing up. And eventually, all of these, uh, most of these introduced trees we're using, um, they need full sun to to keep surviving. 
and our other trees will succeed them. They'll grow over the top of them, shade them out, and they'll, they'll introduce um, species will finish serving their purpose, and by then our soil will have um, undergone a real increase in soil fertility. Um, so we we use them, um, but it, it is just um, they're, they're playing a, a, a role that's temporary, and then they'll be succeeded by natives and fruit trees that will feed us. But they play, they do the heavy lifting. They they really accelerate the process of creating soil fertility. Well, another question for you, Pitfalliwa. Mm-hmm. Have, have you the benefits of fungi? Pardon, sorry? What experience, um, could you speak about experience you may have with the benefits of fungi in this whole process? Absolutely. Um, so, I guess just quickly, like, um, more and more people are becoming aware about, um, you know, the kind of the foundational um, key to to basically healthy ecosystems on Earth is the soil. So if our soil is healthy, there's a ripple effect that that has on all of the rest of the ecosystems. And so one of the keys to that is is, um, having an active microbial life, having fungi, bacteria, nematodes, um, all of those things. There's billions and trillions of them in our soil, but um, so pretty much using these fast, fast-growing trees um, and and doing that constant chopping and dropping and chopping and dropping, that in itself is, is a really stimulating um, has a really stimulating effect on on um, encouraging fungal activity and bacterial activity in our soils. Um, so um, yeah, like we're, we're finding that um, this what this is planted on heavy, heavy clay soil, a little bit of topsoil, but heavy clay soil, and we're finding um, that through through using these strategies, um, we're just having so much beautiful success. Um, everything's growing amazingly. This this was planted a year and a half ago, and we've got trees in there now that are five meters tall. Year and a half ago. We got five meter tree tall, and when we planted them, you know they were just little little seedlings. Um, um, we've got several questions, and I'm just uh, Bring yeah. yeah, 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 far away. Yeah, um, we have a person who's going to be working on a subtropical climate where they'll mainly use perennial. Would you agree with this move? Yep. And how would you control pests in a more prone climate? Um, I'm all about perennials. I guess just just to clarify for anyone who's unsure, um, perennials are plants that are longer lived. They live for more than one year, two, three, four years to hundreds of years, thousands of years. That's a perennial plant. An annual plant is one that only lives for one year, and then it creates seed, and then it dies, and then that seed is what carries it on, but it lives and dies in one year. Um, So... The issue, I guess, with, with annual plants and annual examples of annuals is like broccoli, cauliflower, all, all most of our um, veggies that we consume um, are annuals. Um, the issue with that is that we have to keep going back to disturb the soil, um, which is the opposite of, of um, creating soil fertility. Um, so I'm, I'm really, um, I always encourage um, growing perennial plants um, for that reason. So I think, um, yeah, definitely per- perennial plants are awesome. And you mentioned weed management. Um, most most of the weeds that we have to deal with, um, they need full sun. So you think about kaikuyu grass, oh. um, like m- most of the weeds, like ragwort, lamb's quarters, what like all, all of the main ones. They, they need full sun to be of any effect. So if you can plant densely so that basically what happens is, is you start creating shade, you're growing shade, and you're, if you use fast-growing plants, and they'll start creating a canopy and shading up um, the, the environment so that those weeds will just phase out um, and you won't have to do much work. I mean, initially, if there's the work involved, um, planting, preparing the site, but um, it's super important to, to um, 
if you can understand what a plant needs in order to survive, then you can create conditions for it to either be there or not be there without using any chemical means to do that. There's, you know, just natural ways that we can do that that require less effort. So not why. I, I did some wonderful questions, and I was just wondering whether um, there, there was one about, do you have an Insta or Facebook page that people can follow? Because I, I, I'm trying to find a way to get as many of the questions to you, because they, they are quite excellent questions, such as, have you ever tried harakiki within the system? Uh, and also about getting water to and, and to be maintained in your food forest. Yeah, yeah well, um, Great part. I, I'll, I'll just bring up a, um, a page that I have that will show some links that you can go to. Yep, I've got, um, if you go to Red Haku, that's um, my um, social media um, name, um, Red Haku. But I'll just do a screen share. Uh, that one. Here we go. Um, so Ornuku, if, if you look up Ornuku on Facebook, Instagram, um, you can go on there and, and um, you'll see a page there. Red Haku is my personal page. And then I've got a few other um, phrases here that you might want to look up as well. Um, so yeah, permaculture is one, uh, food forest. Permaculture is probably the leading, that they are the leading practitioners of tropic agroforestry in New Zealand. Um, and they have amazing resources, so I'd highly recommend going going to check that out. There was a what was the question? Sorry, Chloe, that you asked. Oh, I don't know. There is some there's some beautiful questions, but before we um, get back to the main group at twelve, um, I just was wanting to ask everyone um, their reactions to the following questions: What needs to start happening in this area of centropic? Forestry um, for Māori to thrive. Um, and I understand from your Kōrero Ewa that there are pockets of it happening, um, but we have people, um, some of the questions are about Māori based nurseries, uh, people who are on coastal areas, people who are further down south of Motu. I understand you're up there at Pukiana, um and a very different climate to, to other parts of the country. Um, so, yeah, what sort of things need to start happening? This is a question for all of us. And to, if you could pop your answers into the chat, please, here, yeah, Juanma. Um, what needs to start happening in this area of centropic forestry uh, for Māori to thrive? All right, maybe I can, um, I can quickly speak to that, Mark. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I guess for me, um, a, lo a lot of the terminology, a lot of the words and stuff that I'm using um, are kind of unattainable and like confusing. I start talking about density and diversity and succession and stratification and just you start getting lost in all of that. And so for me, um, for more Māori to um, connect with this practice, um, we need to uh, be able to speak to it from a Māori place and, and um, so that whānau can actually digest it and, and understand it and, and, um, and try to implement it. So, and then resources um, that will guide whānau, whānau through that process. And that's, that's what our organisation, Ōnuku, is um, in the process of beginning uh, is resource creation. So, um, what things... Can you can you identify some things that absolutely need to stop now in order for Māori community, whether a hapu, a whānau, a marae, a hapuri, um, to thrive in this area of food foresting? Uh, what needs to stop? Um, I mean, there's there's so many things that our our modern lifestyles are, um, you know, just destructive in, in itself towards the viewer. So um, but I guess I I think I think anything we because what what we need to be open minded, uh, because like a lot of what I'm talking about just really goes against the conventional ways of thinking in terms of um you know planting um, 
one thing in such an abstract way. Um, we're so used to like our gardens are here, the orchards there, and we've got an apple orchard, and each apple tree is four meters apart, and there's grass in the middle, and that's it. Um, you know, that's that's all good, and I understand why that's the case, because um, we need to feed a lot of people, so we've got to be able to mechanize it and make harvesting easy and stuff like that. But um, it's definitely a really unnatural way for, for kai to be grown. So, um, yeah, if we can just stay open-minded, uh, be open to, to new ideas and old ideas and, and bring back um, a lot of the um, kakaro and practices that, that are implemented, I was just thinking, Jared, with your corridor and 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 uh, connecting it to the to the corridor yesterday from Taina and to the 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 natural succession and Katu Kahikitia, they talk about the law. Uh, about the natural order of plantings and working with, and, uh, and as person who as person here in Taranaki who struggles with kikuyu, let alone the dairy desert we have over here, the green desert, tēnā ki mihiki a koe ki a kotau e huama. Um, so I had to wait to know we are we're heading back shortly to the group, and I just didn't want to cut someone off midstream. <laughs> um, but if you might like to, if we do have a bit of time, oh no. Oh, one more minute. Might be another potato, a closing thought from you, Ewa. Um, I'm just, just looking through. Well, yeah, I guess, so I think a food forest is quite a, it doesn't actually capture what um, is offered by this by, by this means of, um, of, of practicing growing and gathering clay. Because um, in, in, our, in our food forests, um, we're growing food, we're growing rongoa, um, we're, even, we're even growing timber. So, um, a lot of these fast-growing species of trees we we're talking about, um, eventually, eight years down the track, um, they'll be um, finishing their time in the food forest and we'll have lots of fat trunks that I can use for fencing posts or timber materials. Um, so it's definitely, this is more than food. Um, there's so much more going on in that, and um, I just really encourage people um, to be curious and go online and um, have a look around. Um, and I always say it, it might be a bit scary to take a dive into it, but um, I think the best thing to do is start, just just have a go. Um, start small, try to do a good job on a really small scale. Um, there'll be mistakes, you'll learn from those mistakes, and, and then you can take those new learnings into um, new spaces and, and um, improve what you're doing there. Um, so, yeah, just, just really encourage, um, if you really want to do it but you're unsure, just go online, do a bit of research, and then just give it a try. Um, and as you go, you'll, you'll learn. Um, yeah. Jennifer, what do you want to do? Um, to just hear how effective your mahi has been in such a short space of time is truly inspiring. Um, but it's just, yeah, it just sounds like another world compared to what we've experienced down there in our Papakangi here in Taranaki, um, and perhaps for others. But to see those shots, and, and ah, there was one question about how often you do you pop and drop. Um, That's our point. I'll cook there so while we've got a little bit of time. So, um, in the spring and autumn, we do like one heavy chop and drop because the sun's not so harsh. And when we do that heavy chop and drop, all that beautiful foliage goes around our fruit trees and then that, that, that lovely autumn and spring sun comes gushing in and our fruit trees and our natives and our rongoa get to benefit from that. <laughs> 